Well, welcome to the Grove Church. We're so glad you are joining us for worship this morning. Uh, we're excited to get to sing together and praise the Lord. I want to invite you now, if you haven't yet, you can go to thegrovekc.com slash today and download resources for this morning's service. And now let's read our call to worship together. It comes from Psalm 86, verses 9 and 10. And it says, All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. He is worthy of our praise. Let's sing together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. faithful through every storm. You've done so much more than we deserved. You have loved us. Will you speak to us today, open our hearts and minds to the truth, and help us. We pray it in the name of Jesus.
Well, hey, good morning, and again, welcome to The Grove. If we haven't met, my name's Christian. I am the lead pastor of The Grove. I am also a sometimes collector of random facts, and I don't know if you've been staying close to your scientific journals lately, but I wonder, have you heard that back in April 2020, uh, scientists recorded the very first cosmic blast within our Milky Way galaxy? Were, were you following that? No? Not, not really? That one escaped your notice? Well, here's some detail, right? They're called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. And here's a picture. This is a, an artist's rendering of what they think this might look like out in outer space. And uh, just some other things about these FRBs. The, these bursts, they vanish in just milliseconds. And uh, at the same time, they are the brightest signals in the universe. They're powered by as much energy as scientists believe, get this, 100 million suns, okay, 100 million suns. And this particular FRB that uh, happened back in April, it originate, originated only about 32,616 light years away. Now, you say, well, that's a lot of light years, but actually, that's actually very close. And when I say close, I mean very, very close, because the next closest burst uh, that we've recorded was about 490 million light years away in a whole other galaxy. And, and here's the kicker, until just recently, no one knew the source of these bursts. In fact, for the last 13 years, since they were first, uh, one of these FRBs was first spotted in 2007, for the last 13 years, uh, astronomers um, have come up with all kinds of theories about what these might be, where they come from. They've wondered if they were a collision of black holes or neuron stars, or if they're connected to gamma ray bursts or hyperflares of magnetars, blitzars, or what follow from the dark matter-induced collapse of pulsars, right? And all this kind of stuff that you think about. And, and of course, they, they could also be axion mini clusters. They could be cosmic string pulsatings, or of course, it could be something related to the general theory of super radiance not to mention extraterrestrial activity. Okay. Now, maybe you've been thinking again about a lot of these different theories. And if you had your money on magnetars, well, you win the office pool, okay? That's what they finally discovered after this FRB in April, that uh, these bursts are related to something called magnetars. Now, I'm not gonna even explain or try to explain what a magnetar is. You can read a number of articles on, on websites like Engadget or uh, Wired even has some articles about this. But, but why all the curiosity? Why, why all this interest in these FRBs? Well, it was one article states, scientists, scientists believe that fast radio bursts could ultimately help us learn what's in between galaxies after all, and that they could give us a more complete picture of our universe. Okay, so again, for astronomers, scientists, this is, this is really important, really interesting, fascinating stuff. And as I'm talking about uh, these cosmic bursts, I can't help but find a parallel to all the same fascination and mystery and theories that surrounded uh, the time when Jesus burst onto the scene 2,000 years ago. And it begs this question for us. Do you experience Jesus like this in the way that scientists experience FRBs? Right? What I mean is, do you experience all the wonder and fascination of Jesus like, like this, like that picture, right? Like think about just the wonder that's encapsulated in, in seeing what might be out there in, in all these, uh, this outer space. Or is your impression of Jesus so typical, so predictable, so maybe caricatured that you could adequately describe kind of your impressions of him like this? You know one of these? You ever seen a flannel graph? Right? Now, of course, if we really think about it, and if we're, we're paying attention, we, we know he's neither of these. He's not an FRB, right? Jesus, we believe, is neither a fast radio burst, nor is he a piece of cut-out flannel. Right? We believe that he is God incarnate, that he is fully man and fully God in the flesh. But in the very least, as you think about these two images, these two ideas, which of the two are... Well, which, are more, which one's more intriguing to you? Which one would maybe capture uh, the way you've responded to Jesus? 
in your own life. We're in our third week of the Have Courage series, and we're walking together through the Gospel of Mark with really friends from all over the world. And last week, we explored John the Baptist's prophetic introductions of Jesus. We looked at Jesus' baptism, and we, we saw his temptation in the wilderness and what those things all mean for us. And this week, we, we see Jesus coming out of his own wilderness, arriving on the scene with a burst, with a shock of energy, chock full of grace and verve, kindness and moxie, where no one knows exactly what to make of him. And so we're going to start today in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and we're going to continue on into about the, the midway point of Mark chapter 3. Mark continues his introduction of Jesus by providing us the summary of Jesus' ministry and message straight from Jesus' own mouth, right? This is going to come straight from Jesus. This is what he's here to do. This is what he's here to announce. This is what he's here to embody, to, to bring to bear on our lives and on our world. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 says, After John was arrested, that's John the Baptist, he gets arrested, and Jesus goes to Galilee. He went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. There's that term again. It's the very first verse in the Gospel of Mark, the good news of of God. And he says this, this was the message, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And I want you to notice three aspects of that message. He says the time is fulfilled, right? A, a new era. He's announcing a new era, a, an epic of God time. It's a, a Greek word, kairos. It's a, a new, uh, like, global season, cosmic season in time. And it's upon us. This is no ordinary time. It's the kind, of, uh, the kind that makes time stand still in a certain way. It, it's the kind of time that makes you wonder where all the time went because you're being ushered into something, caught up into a whole new realm, a, a glorious storm of goodness, so to speak. It's a new time. And Jesus also then announces a kingdom. We're, we're talking here about a whole new universe or a, a, an omniverse, right? A unique realm that pulsates out the rule and reign of God. And this kingdom is the deep heart of God that is bursting into our time and space and matter. And then he says, okay, this, this new time is here. This kingdom is coming and it is near, right? It is near. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus has entered and triumphed in his own wilderness to signal to all people that an eternal leaving of the wilderness is possible. That's what we looked at last week. And what we're seeing here is that after 400 years of silence, the God who has seemed far away and silent Jesus is announcing that God has come near, and he is making quite the impression. It's an impression like a cosmic burst, brighter than a hundred million suns, which is to say this, that when Jesus bursts onto the scene, the result is the best kind of explosive. It's the best kind of of explosive. We, we tend to associate explosions with destruction. We tend to think of them in these negative terms, but, but think about it, right? Fireworks exploding over Oak Grove Park produce awe and delight. Gasoline exploding in the engine of your car allows you to travel to work and make a living, to, to make your way to a vacation destination for some re relaxation, and, and countless other places, right? We're, we're grateful for that explosion that takes place in our cars. Explosions on our sun, right? Th those are the source of light and heat that are needed for living. There are some good explosions that we benefit from. And, and today, again, we're going to span the first uh, two and a half chapters of Mark and, and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And what we find is, simil is a similar kind of life-giving, awe-inspiring explosiveness. As we make our way through, just want to take this, this sort of survey of these couple of chapters, bursting with presence. At the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus goes to two fishermen, and he says, follow me. And scripture says, at once they left their nets and followed him. Two others end up ditching their dad in their boat, and they do the same. Bursting with authority, 
Jesus teaches in synagogues. And it's so unique, it's, it's so head-turning, that, again, the scripture tells us that the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Bursting with power, Jesus casts out a demon. He heals a loved one, and he wouldn't stop healing until sundown because, again, in Mark 1.33, the whole town gathered at the door. People were flocking to him to be healed, to receive the power working in them. Bursting with a certain sort of intimacy, Jesus ducks out under the night's cover to be with his heavenly Father, and, and frankly, it miffs his friends. And they, in no uncertain terms, give him the business. Right? They tell him in Mark 1.37, everyone is looking for you. Where are you? What are you doing? He needed to be with his father. Bursting with compassion, Jesus touches a leper and, and heals him. And Jesus says to that leper, go show yourself as clean to the priest, but try to keep this just between us. But of course, the guy goes and, and he tells everyone. He's shouting it, clean, clean, I'm clean. And now Jesus has to go live out kind of in the sticks to avoid the unwelcomed attention of the authorities. And yet, Scripture tells us, the people still came to him from everywhere. They were coming from all over. Bursting through a roof, friends brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus, who, who healed both his legs and his heart. See, the man got up, he, he peeled the mat off his legs, and Scripture tells us, Mark 1, uh, 2, verse 12, that he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Bursting through all protocol, Jesus ate with the misfits and outcasts. He, he told them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. At one point, bursting with anger, Jesus stares down the religious elite. He's distressed by their stubborn hearts, and he, he says to a man with a deformed hand, stretch out your hand. And the man's shriveled hand burst through, fully formed, flexible, right? It's doing all it's supposed to do, functioning as hands were designed to work. But Jesus did it on the Sabbath, which was a big no-no. And he made the religious leaders even more upset. Groups that didn't like each other, but who now had a common enemy in Jesus, they kind of got in, you know, they became bedfellows. They, they, they banded together to oppose him. What we're told, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And bursting, bursting through to get him, the crowds did anything they could to see, touch, and be near him. We're told, Mark 3.10, he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. In fact, even the demons, even these folks that were, were demonized, they burst through to disrupt his work, but he, we're told, would strongly warn them not to make him known. I, I don't know about you, but I don't think flannel does justice to all of that. It's just that 2D image isn't enough. And what's more, right, as you think about what's demonstrated, again, in this, these early stages of Jesus' ministry, uh, is that we've been through one of the most explosive, in the very worst way, years that any of us can recall. Right? I mean, you think about it. We've talked about this, but, but COVID-19, it, it made us feel helpless and small and vulnerable, uncertain, in some ways distrusting, cynical, maybe fearful. And it's exposed just how little control we really have over our lives and the world. You think about the pain and anguish in our streets that was crying out in the form of protests. And we had opinions, but, but those protests remind us of our own biases, of our feelings of, of impotence, of, of paralysis, and, and really a yearning for peace. Our economy continues to, to sputter in a certain way, and many of us are still without jobs, we're on furlough, we've lost businesses, or, or, or things are just not as they were just a year ago. We, we've just seen the worst, most divisive presidential election, perhaps in U.S. history, um, and we're wondering, right? I mean, there's these, this questioning of, will we ever recover from all this division and vitriol? And then you realize mentally, right, many, 
are, well, not well. Uh, anxiety, depression, suicides are spiking at unprecedented number. It has been an explosive year. And we all, we need Jesus to burst into our hearts. We need Jesus to burst into our homes, into our world as much as ever. We need to be reminded and assured of what Jesus is capable of and what he wants to do in our lives. So what does this snapshot of Jesus' explosive ministry mean for us? Three important things for us to, to take away as we look at the way Jesus worked as he began his ministry. The first one is this. I want us to remember that Jesus is bursting with power today. Jesus is bursting with power today. Right, wrap your head, head around this with me. We believe that Jesus is, like we mentioned earlier, 100% human and 100% God. He is a member of the one triune God, right? And within the Godhead, there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's from within God himself that all things were formed from nothing which means that God is the originator and source of all energy, power, and every galaxy, universe, multiverse, and string, and and and, and you know, all that stuff. God, this God of all creativity and power became human flesh and walked among us. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Right? He, he's as ordinary, Jesus in one respect, is as ordinary a guy as your neighbor down the street, and yet he's ex as extraordinary and far more as a cosmic burst, brighter than a zillion suns. And again, Scripture tells us, Colossians 1.16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is glorious. Do, do you know what's exceptionally important about that right now? Hebrews 13.8 tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus at creation is the same Jesus in the flesh 2,000 years ago, is the same Jesus that bursts upon the scene in our lives today. And so in light of this, I wonder, this question for us, what might Jesus' power mean for you today? How might you ask him to burst through and work in your life? How might you want to see him change things in, in your situation? Well, I mean, look, be honest. What, how might you need to come to him and ask him to, to burst through and make something different? Do you believe that he is powerful to work? We're not, we're not talking about I dream a genie and him just bobbing his head and snapping his fingers or whatever and it all just getting fixed all at once. But, but do we believe that he is powerful to change things in our own lives. Do you believe that in your life? And as you think about that, right, as you think about his power, know this, that not only is he bursting with power, but, but as he begins to work in our situations, as he begins to work through us, he's also going to do something else. And that is that, that he did back then, and he'll do that today, which is that Jesus is bursting paradigms. Jesus is bursting paradigms. We all have, we've been talking about paradigms in our groups. We, have all, we all have ways of looking at things, patterns that we form to help us understand the world. That's a paradigm. But not all of our paradigms are helpful. And when Jesus announces and begins ushering in the kingdom, he's bringing a whole new paradigm with him. His own mom sang about him, sang out at his birth that uh, in Luke 1, 51 to 52, he says, she says, God scatters those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. We, we talk about this often in terms of God's upside down kingdom. Jesus, through Jesus, God shows us, man, things are, need to be turned a different way. What seems right side up needs to be turned upside down. And what seems upside down actually is right side up if we can see it rightly. And so we see this time and time again in Jesus' adult life. He, he's bursting the pride of the leaders and raising up the busted and the broken. 
He, he's flipping things on their heads. Again, the temple is, is now, in Jesus' mind, the temple is, is not where you go to encounter God because the temple now, through Jesus, becomes in, in me. God comes to me. He comes to you. He comes to his people to live and dwell in them. In a certain way, who's in now in Jesus' time is now out, and who's always been out can now come right in. He's, he's turning things around, changing them up. No more dividing lines, no more tears. Uh, you know, as far as like hierarchy, all can come to the table. He makes those in power look impotent, and he treats the powerless like princes. He's, he's turning things all around. And later... Jesus' purpose was brought into clearer focus for his followers. And the paradigm-bursting nature of Jesus' work was explained like this. I want us to, to see this and follow along with me. It's, it's dealing with a whole specific thing we could get off into. I don't want to get too deep into it, but, but it does help us understand just how different Jesus' ministry is intended to be. Well, we're told this in 2 Corinthians 3. If the ministry that brought condemnation had glory... The ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. At this point, the contrast is the ministry of the law, okay, the Old Testament law. And that's being contrasted with the ministry of Jesus, the ministry that brings righteousness. It, it, the Apostle Paul who's writing this goes on. He says, in fact, what had been glorious, the, the law had been glorious, is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious... What endures will be even more glorious. In other words, as Scripture tells us, the law had a point. It, it was there for, for a while. It, it had a certain ministry. The law of God had a certain ministry, a certain purpose, it, but it had a time stamp. It, it had an expiration. And it was good and glorious for that time, but it was never intended to produce eternal, enduring life, eternal, enduring righteousness. So Jesus comes and his ministry shines so much brighter that the old way, by comparison, is now dead and dim. It's, it's not that it wasn't serving the purpose it was supposed to, but it's just that we have to understand that purpose is limited. And when compared to the glory of Jesus, of what he's doing, man, there's just really no comparison. So the question for us today what, what ways of thinking and doing does God want to turn upside down in your life so that they're right side up? Right? What, what kind of paradigms does he need to, to blow up? What kind of patterns of, of thinking and doing do, does he want to change? Because this is what's going to happen. If, if we begin to lean on him and lean on his power, as we embrace his power, uh, he's going to work not just through us, not just in our circumstances. He's going to work in us. He's going to change us. And sometimes we want that. We welcome it. Other times it's harder. But that's what he does. And in the end, that is what is good. And that's what we need. And, and so, as, again, as we embrace Jesus' power and as he upends our paradigms, there's one last thing for us to understand. Is that the work that God does in us, that God does through us, in Jesus means that we can burst with joyful courage today. He wants to produce, he wants to produce an explosion of joyful courage in us. Everywhere that Jesus went, the people were delighted. They were amazed. Right now, there were people that were opposed to him, but, but the crowds would come, they were amazed, they were overwhelmed, they were drawn, compelled, invited, and it was so new, and the pressure had been building for so long, the despair so palpable, that the wilderness of his silence was so loud that they could not contain it. They, they were bursting, wanting hope, and hope could no longer wait because they, they got a glimpse. Wait, Jesus is the one to bring us the hope that we need. Listen to what Jesus says when he was challenged by the authorities about all of his bursting energy, bursting bubbles and, and paradigms. Listen to what happens. Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, it says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and asked him, Why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but your disciples do not fast? In other words, we've got these practices that we've all been doing. Well, why are you not doing them? And Jesus goes on, he, he says to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. 
But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. Furthermore, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost as well as the skins. No, new wine is put into fresh wineskin. Jesus likens his ministry to three things. First, a wedding feast. He says, look, I'm here and I'm bringing the party with me. When you think about a wedding, when the bride and groom are together, what do we do? We, we eat cake, we dance, we drink. At least Jesus did. And in that culture, it could last all week. Right? When, when, when that's going on, you don't fast or frown, you feast. That's what Jesus is comparing his presence to this party. And then he compares it to sewing a patch. He says, look, things are bursting at the seam here. The old containers of your old, tired, and oppressive religion are creating more holes in the garment. And then they're repairing. There's something, we need a, a, a new thing to, to fix this. And so he says, my ministry also is like new wine. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, no, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Right? Jesus likens his arrival to a party, to a new patch, to a new batch of wine that ferments and expands in texture, texture and tannins and finer notes until it bursts with flavor that this world has never truly known. But it's a flavor that the world desperately needs. And he, he wants our lives to spread the flavor, this flavor of his kingdom. And this is why the impact of the new that Jesus brings is it's described like this. We'll go back to 2 Corinthians 3. Well, what, what kind of newness is this to produce in us? Not just for us, but in us. We're told in 2 Corinthians 3.12, Since then, we have such a hope, this kind of hope that Jesus is describing here, we act with great boldness. The word here, the idea, is cheerful courage. See, Christ has come. The kingdom of heaven is here. And this new ministry is bursting with glory. And so, we can have hope. And that hope then allows us, it, it, in fact, it, it compels us to act with joy and with courage. Right? Joy is not something that we manufacture. Joy is meant to be the product of us more and more leaning into the magnificence of who Christ is and what he's done and what he calls us to. There's joy in knowing what we've been saved from, what we've been saved to. It allows us to move forward boldly, courageously. We can rejoice and boldly lean on the Lord. We can joyfully walk in his ways. And, and we don't do this because the outcome here is in doubt and, and darkness will, will overcome. Right? We're fearful that this is all just going to end badly. No, we do this because the God of the cosmos has overcome the world. Uh, we don't rejoice and live boldly because we live in denial apart from this world, but because we are called to be a redeeming light in the world. And we don't seek to live like this because he's, he's mad or frustrated or disappointed at us, in us, but because God loves us us. He loves you. He, he wants to be with you. He wants you to, to stick by his side and learn from him. This is the kind of life we're called to. He comes to me and he comes to you like a cosmic burst. He is brighter than a million, a hundred million suns, brighter than a zillion suns. He is glorious. And he wants to work powerfully in us. He wants to work powerfully through us. He wants to powerfully change us. That will be disruptive, but it will be delightful. It will be incredible. And I'm not talking pie in the sky. We're talking about nuts and bolts in the place that we live. But, but letting wonder drive us forward. Letting our curiosity to know Jesus better to know his ways, to, to let him restructure and, 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 and turn upside down a lot of what we think we think and to live in a way that is 
pleasing to him and is good. This, friends, is, is why we say, as we've been saying, have courage. On your feet, he's calling you. Let's pray. Father, would you help us to not be satisfied with a flat and tame picture of Jesus? Would you help us to embrace the wonder of walking with Jesus? God, we we need some inspiration. we, We do need that. Well, we need to, to be captivated by how good and great you are, to, to glimpse your glory and, and to be transformed by that. But Lord, help us to not make the mistake of thinking this is just all philosophical talk that, that has no bearing on how we're going to act as we're going through the, the drive through line at lunch or, or when we're going to engage with our coworkers tomorrow at work. Lord, help us to see that your power is available to work in us today, that you want to change us, you want to help us, and you want us to move forward in joyful courage, not to earn something, not to try to, to appease you, but because of the work of Jesus on our behalf that gives us freedom and gives us hope. So may we be a people of joyful courage, Lord, and may you be honored. May people see just how great and glorious you are. May they get a taste, get a a whiff of the wonderful flavor that the kingdom of heaven brings. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. His will be done here and now on earth as it is in heaven. We declare this day He is God of all and we are one church. We won't be is our King. Lift the banner higher, we sing. Jesus is our King. We are united forever as one. He is everything, every breath we Run every chain undone. 
Paulson and I serve on the Grove's worship team. Here at the Grove, we want to help connect you to resources and relationships that will encourage you in your walk with God. The best place to do that is by filling out an online connection card at thegrovekc.com and click church today. There you can tell us how we can be praying for you and next steps that you would like to take. Operation Oddfellows is coming along great. Ceiling has lights, we have paint going up. It's been really fun and exciting to see. Um, we will be working our normal hours this week. So that is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. On Wednesdays, we will be there until 9 p.m. And Saturday, we will be there from 9 to 5. If you'd like to help paint or if you'd like to get connected in any other way, head on over to our website and click connect. Finally, I'd like to invite you to give as an act of worship and to help move the mission of the Grove forward. The best place to do that is by going to our website and clicking give. Thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday morning with us. Um, please join us as we sing a final song. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead Peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. the 
Guys, as we wrap up today, I want to continue to invite you to help us out uh, with Operation Odd Fellows. Uh, as I mentioned in my email update this weekend, uh, you know, as we're plugging away, as we're getting closer, uh, you know, it's fun to see things take shape. There's there's stuff going in. There's paint on the walls, door frames, there's lights. It's been awesome to see, and and so many people are pitching in. Please hear me with with gratitude for all the work that's going in. But but even as we get closer, uh, what starts to come into focus is all the little details, all the little things that are going to need to be happening. And it's one of those situations where instead of just kind of big projects, there's a lot of little things. And that's where having a number of people giving of just a little bit of time where we can have you go do a few tasks in half an hour, an hour or more really makes a huge difference. You know, many hands makes a, a light load or, or something along those lines. So we would love to have you come out uh, any, any time this week uh, in the evening. Some of you, your, your schedules were different. You said, hey, can I come during the day? And so we've had people come during the day. Uh, that's always welcome. We're, we're in the building, one of us, uh, all throughout the week. And so it's easy for us to schedule having you come in and, and help out. We'd love to have your help as we draw closer and closer to seeing this place ready for us to move in. And so please continue to consider how you can help. Please continue to, to pray for the project. Pray that uh, things will happen in a really good way. And uh, with that, we want to pray uh, again, as we do, for our partners and uh, our missional praying. And uh, today I want to pray for Ridgeview Church. It's one of the church plants that we support, uh, Ridgeview excuse me, is out in Fontana, California, pastored by Alex Barrett, uh, his team out there. Man, they've done a fantastic job. This is the church we were able to go out and help, not this past summer, but the summer before with a sports camp. And they continue to, uh, to God continues to bless the ministry out there. This is a picture uh, back from the summer. They had a, a baptism uh, there. And, uh, and so it's been fun to see God continue to work in that community. Uh, they are in California. And as you know, if you follow the news, it's been really difficult for churches out in California. But man, they're being creative, they're trusting the Lord, um, and they're figuring out ways to continue to do the, the work of ministry that God has called them to. And so we want to pray uh, for their efforts, pray for them, uh, and uh, continue to, to ask the Lord to bless what they're doing. So join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, the work of the gospel, seeing uh, this message of the, the nearness of the kingdom and the kingdom spreading. I see that message go out. We're, we're grateful to be a part of it in our own community. We're grateful to get to be a part of it in communities around the world, really. Um, and we pray for Ridgeview. We pray for Pastor Alex, for his family, for their team, uh, that you continue to encourage them, continue to give them strength and, and energy, um, give them creative thinking and wisdom to be able to make the most of, of the freedom that they do have. Uh, we do pray for the whole state of California and as it pertains especially to churches that um, while we do want people to be healthy and, and all those things, we, we pray that churches would be able to um, do the ministry that you've called them to and that uh, some of the restrictions would be lessened that would allow them uh, to more effectively engage people who uh, need to know you and uh, we want to see, come to know you. So again, work through Ridgeview, work in the city of Fontana, draw people to yourself. Uh, we pray, God, for your glory and for the good of those folks. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Well, with that, may the love of the Father, may the grace of the Son, Jesus, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you now and until Jesus comes back. You guys have a great week. We will see you next time.